Good morning. Welcome home to Mailer's Landing. I'm Sue and we are here in Growing Zone 6B in New England and it is frosty outside. It is really frosty outside. Like the chicken water froze overnight and the goats were unhappy to come out of the hutch kind of frosty. So I figured why not come downstairs and show you the pantry. I've never done a pantry tour before um, and I just I love my little pantry. So come on along. Come see what's going on here. I feel like one of the first things you're going to notice upon seeing my pantry is that it's it's small. I didn't start canning to do tremendous amounts. I started canning a decade ago just to kind of preserve the harvest. I had a lot of cucumbers on my hands and so pickles. Um, and now everybody expects pickles of me, so I'm still making them 10 years later. But most of the things that I make, I only make a half dozen to a dozen of. Um, there were a couple of exceptions this year, which... I'll show you. Um, but in general, if I'm canning something, I may only be making a handful of them. Here's a good example. I made green tomato relish um, and I only made 10 little jars, 12 little jars, something like that. Just a little bit, because that's all we use. I'm only cooking for four people. So small batch canning is kind of perfect for us. Let's talk about pickles, because I did three different kinds this year. I did um, a dill pickle with, there's you can see there's turmeric on the bottom. Um, they're a little bit spicy, but milder than the bread and butter pickles that I do every year. Um, they're a little fiery. Can you see the, yeah. They're a little fiery. They've got some Thai chilies in there from our garden last year and the year before. Um, and they are freaking great. And then I made, this is new for us. I made kimchi pickles. So I didn't ferment these like you would do kimchi. You can ferment and make kimchi um, pickles and they're delicious. They're fermented. They sit on your counter um, and do the fermenty dance. And I, I really just, I don't have the counter space for that. So I went for the flavor and I added all kinds of good stuff in here. Um, and they came out a little more like sriracha pickles than kimchi pickles, but they're delicious. I will make these again. I will make these again. We have maple syrup up here. Um, I do a lot of gifting with these, so we only have like two jars left and we're going to go through them sparingly. Um, luckily, mapling season is right around the corner, so we'll be ready to do another round of that. I did a whole bunch of applesauce this year and we don't grow apples ourselves. We don't have um, the trees here, but we live right up the street from an orchard. So we get their apples every year and I can those. So I did a whole bunch of applesauce this year put them in these adorable little jars and I think I wound up doing like four each of different flavors. This one is fennel and anise. I also did a traditional brown sugar and cinnamon with nutmeg um, but salted. I did a black pepper and cardamom um, and I did a garam masala which was fantastic. And speaking of apples, these are pickled apples. These are one of my favorite seasonal things. I have, I have two jars left and I'm saving them for Thanksgiving. Um, but isn't it, first of all, it's beautiful. All these lovely spices and the apple chunks. Um, but it's also, it's one of the best tasting things I've ever done. Use red delicious apples in these and I put in pickle crisp too and they stay just, they're the perfect texture, perfect texture. And they're, they're on the sticky sweet side, but the vinegar kind of balances it out. So that was the other thing that I did with apples this year. And then new stuff. I did a whole bunch of things that are new to me that I had never done before. I had never done jam before this year, and this was so much fun. Um, I did strawberry, which I'm just absolutely thrilled with this. We did um, two each cardamom black pepper, um, fennel and anise. Can you, can you, there's kind of a trend here. Um, 
za'atar. I think I used the last of the za'atar on that. And what else is back here? And one straight up strawberry. Because Bill likes, Bill's a bit of a purist. Uh, last year's apple butter is still in here. We'll use this up pretty soon. Because we're coming up on like jammies and warm toast time, you know? Also new to me this year, I canned some fruit. Um, I did pears. We were able to get pears up at the orchard. And I did a cold pack on them, as long as Ball told me to do it in a simple syrup. They look like they might be a little soft, um, but Bill keeps telling me it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Um, I did them all different. One wound up with ginger in it, one wound up with cinnamon sticks in it, one wound up with, well, I'll be damned, fennel and anise in it. Um, and I'm sure there's one with peppercorns and cardamom. <laughs> um, but that was kind of an adventure. I had never done fruit before. And I think I would probably do it in a different size jar. I used these Atlas jars that, um, that, that tomato sauce comes in. I reused their jars and they're skinny and I can't get my whole hand down in there. So, um, Packing these jars was a little bit of an adventure. I would like to do these in wider jars next year. Something else that I did brand new this year is daikon pickle. I did um, this recipe straight out of the, the ball book. I grew daikons this year and I like them fresh, but I grew a lot of daikons. So I thought, oh, I should see if I could do something about that. So we pickled these up with Lord, the biggest carrot I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> this thing had girth. Um, and cut it all into matchsticks and pickled it up according to the ball canning book recipe. And we'll find out what that's like. We'll find out if we like it. Something fun about this, and this happens sometimes, the garlic turned blue from the particulars of the vinegar in this, which I always find kind of hilarious. I did onions again this year. Last year, I grew peony onions and um, I found a recipe for malt vinegar onions and it's fantastic. So these are pub pickled onions and I saw a whole bunch of recipes that said, oh, you should just quick pickle this because if you can it, it's gonna wind up mushy. These did not come out mushy. Um, I used the pickle crisp in it they weren't mushy at all. Uh, it's it's a very simple solution with malt vinegar and some spices and a bay leaf. It's it's really really good. I think I did two jars of this this year. Again, I'm still learning how to grow onions, and in the meantime, these are fantastic. Something else I like to can every year is what we call Fautel, um, F-A-U-X-T-E-L. I like Rotel as part of a whole bunch of different recipes that I make. Uh, so being able to take the tomatoes out of the garden, and yes, I supplemented, I supplemented, because um, most of our tomatoes, if you remember, were those tiny, tiny tomatoes. Um, so I supplemented with paste tomatoes from the farm stand that's up by the hardware store. They're super nice over there. Um, and got about, I would say I've got about 11 or 12 of these and we'll use these all winter long. Um, we'll probably run out early on this. I use a fair amount of it, but I'll use it in things like soups. Um, I'll use it with, to make rices. Uh, I can even use it in a pot roast. I've done that before. It's really good stuff. Um, so I try to do this every year. So much of this came out of the garden, but I want you to understand not all of it came out of the garden. For example, I grew about half of the strawberries that went into this jam in my own garden, and then I supplemented with local produce. Um, the cucumbers, the first round of cucumbers were our cucumbers. The second round of cucumbers were cucumbers that Lib found at a, at a, um, were cucumbers that Lib found at a farm stand and they were just gorgeous. So he brought them home for me to pickle. Um, the pears, they came from 
the orchard up the street. The apples that went into the applesauce also came from the orchard up the street. If it's local, you know, I mean, the maple was as local as you get. That comes out of our trees. But if it's local-ish, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it. I don't live my life alone. I live my life in community. And that's important to me. So if I, I don't have to grow it all myself, I don't have to be some kind of um, American exceptionalist. I don't have to do it all myself. And that's a beautiful comfort. At least 50% of this came out of my garden, but the other 50% came out of my neighbor's gardens, the farms that are local, um, the little stand up by the hardware store where she's got great squash. I don't have to do it all myself. There's something to be said for self-sufficiency. But if we're if we try to pretend that we don't live in concert with the other people in our communities, plural, because most of us are in at least two, um, then we're really not, we're not being honest with ourselves because we do live in concert with our communities. We do live in concert with our friends and we can depend upon each other. That's the social contract, right? That said, let me show you the proudest thing that I have canned this year. Okay, so these are mushrooms. These are mushrooms that came from the grocery store and they were white button mushrooms. The reason I have white button mushrooms is because I only grew enough wine caps to fill two jars. And I didn't want to put up just two jars for 90 minutes in the pressure canner like you do with mushrooms. So um, these are the wine caps that we put the spawn down in March and they flushed for us in September. And I got two beautiful jars out of it, one for us and one for Mike and Aubrey. And I'm just, I'm so proud of this. I'm so proud of this. I think it's that, A, we go through a lot of mushrooms. Um, we like mushrooms. I cook with them all the time. But also, I had never grown them before. So being able to do this, like, from beginning to end, and we went through semi-local mushroom people, too. We went through North Spore to get our mushroom spawn. Um, and here it is coming around. We're just increasing the biodiversity in the yard with things that we eat. It's just exciting. So these mushrooms, absolutely just look at them wine caps. <sighs> these are my second favorite two jars. So I ran out of beets halfway through this jar, but I did indeed have a whole lot of beans. So I just put the beans in the jar with the beets and now I can't stop looking at it because it's super pretty. Aren't you pretty? I'm pretty. And then there are the beans. I, I was the bean queen this year. I was absolutely the bean queen this year. My goal was to get the arches all full of beans. And I did, I did, I did, I did. <laughs> and I got beans down at the uh, Land Trust Community Garden. And we canned them. We canned a whole bunch. I started doing them in pint jars. Um, and then someplace along the road, I realized that when we do a dinner, I had been bringing down two pint jars and there was a little left over. So... Switched gears a couple weeks in and started putting them in the pint and a half jars. And these were great. Just one thing I want to show you is they siphon. They siphon a little more than, um, than the pint jars do in the pressure canner, which was interesting for me. But they're still good. The water level's a little low, but we've brought it to temp. We've had it under pressure um, and it's pressure canned and sealed. So it's still good. Um, in fact, we had some last night and I am not dead. The other big exception that we had this year was salsa verde. We had, <laughs> I have a remarkable amount of salsa verde down there. Um, we had a remarkable amount of tomatillos in the garden this year. So we had what I had planted and then we had the volunteers and they were delicious. So I've got something like 
30 odd jars of roasted tomatillo salsa. And then in the freezer upstairs, I've got, I'd say another two gallons of sliced tomatillos to just cook with on the fly. Um, so yeah, tomatillos, we, we did well by this year and the roasted tomatillo salsa, I'm, I'm so glad that this wound up not being particularly small batch in the end. I mean, I did it in batches of like nine to 12. So I, I guess it's small batches. Um, but we, we wound up with quite a lot of it and that's awesome because everybody loves this stuff. So it's not big batch. It's not prepping, okay? It is something to feed the family over the winter. And on any given day, there are like four to six of us. So this is ideal for the number of people that we feed in this house. Um, in fact, there's some things that I'm not gonna make again next year because we won't go through them very quickly. Like um, the relish, there's enough relish there to last us a couple of years, even if we gift. We will go through those pumpkins pretty fast because there will be two or three pie making occasions. Um, I did this year pick up something brand new to me. I got a couple of squashes that I tried to grow this year <laughs> to no avail. Anyway, we'll do it different. We'll do it different. It's okay. Um, I picked up a Boston Marrow squash and a... Blue Hubbard squash. And the goal is to make some squash pies, which I've never done before. So next year we'll do the next step in learning how to grow them. Um, and this year we'll learn how to make pie out of them. <laughs> I picked up some delicata and some acorn squash. Um, so we have a little bit of variety over the winter time for things to eat. And really that's the pantry. Um, you know, I've got, we've got the canning over here. Lib's got some stuff over there that he's working on with brewing and trying out some fermenting stuff over there. Um, <clears throat> and we have, we have a little tobacco hanging over there. Um, I have no idea what's going on with that. I've got to touch base with Lib and find out. But yeah, it's, it's not a massive production. It's not 60 jars of tomato sauce. It's not, well, I mean, it's mostly beans, but you know what I'm saying here is I don't do big production because we don't need big production. People hear that we have goats and chickens and they immediately jump to, oh, you homestead, are you a prepper? Um, and there's this assumption that and there's this assumption of prepperness. Well, I don't think I'm a prepper in like an apocalyptic sort of way. This is a joyful process for me. I don't, which is not to say I don't see rain coming when the skies are gray, you know. Um, and I like to keep our medicine on stock. I don't like to run out of animal feed. It's that kind of a thing. But I wouldn't say that I'm looking at things breaking down. If they do, <laughs> um, we won't be caught entirely with our pants down. But it was nice last year during supply chain issues to be able to come downstairs and just grab a few things that I wasn't going to be able to grab at the market um, because it just wasn't there. <laughs> so that's been nice. So, yeah, there's a little bit of prepping. Um, I'm trying to grow as much food as I can because I'm a bit of a foodie, too. But it's not, um, I don't feel like we're looking down the barrel of the apocalypse. I like shelf stable things because occasionally the electric goes out. You know, it's that kind of stuff. But yeah, so we don't, we don't have need to go that big. I mean, um, and about, I would say about a third of every batch never even makes it downstairs. Either we eat it or we've given it away, which is super fun too. So yeah, that's that's my humble little pantry. Thank you so much for coming down and visiting my pantry with me. Uh, it has been a delight to show it off a little bit. And I will catch you up soon. Take care.
So our basement in a lot of ways is, it's a place for projects. Um, there's a lot happening down here. <laughs> Raina's got her beautiful plants down here. We've got art projects in the back. 